Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. All right, we're starting a new series called Second Wind. And um, I know for some of you, you may understand that um, the, the, just the, 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 the way God created us. Is, is just so incredible in how our, how our body and our mind functions. Uh, I know that, uh, that many times when, when, let's say, you run a marathon race, at the 8 man, I couldn't believe it. there's like eight people who have run the marathon in our church. I'm like, dang, that's awesome. we got some healthy people up in this place. That's awesome. Any marathon runners here in this place that have run the marathon for real? Not like, I'm talking about like you finished it, not like you thought about it. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, one person. Okay, great. Well, when you run, I used to love running. But there was a point when I would run, let's say I do a 5K, um, I did, I've done cross country, and, um, and there was, there's a point in your running where your, your mind will start telling you, you are tired, you are, stop, stop, don't, do, no more, you got, you're done, and you just, you're, 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 you're like, your mind is convincing your body that you can't take another step. Well, let me tell you something. In your walk with God, in your walk in this life or through this life, in this journey, there are going to be moments in your life where you're going to feel like I can't take another step. But by God's grace and mercy and, and his, his awesomeness and how he created us inside and, and how he speaks so much about the mind. How many know that, that the mind was never meant to rule you? You were meant to rule your mind. And the mind will always play tricks on you, and your mind will tell you what you should do or what you should not do. But when you renew the spirit of your mind, then you can begin to take authority over those thoughts, authority over those lies. And you, ha- you have to start learning what, like 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, you got to cast down every thought and every vain imagination that is trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And you need to bring that thought captive to the obedience of Christ Jesus. And then Jesus goes ahead and just... Crushes it. And so, as a runner, you get this thing called the second wind. Let me give you the definition for second wind. Look. Second wind is a phenomenon in distance running, such as marathons or road running, as well as other sports, whereby an athlete who is out of breath (sighs) and too tired to continue suddenly finds their strength to press on at top performance with less exertion. That is awesome that God has created us. God has built in us a will to trump, to override anything that we are facing in this life. And I don't know what your struggle is. I don't know what your challenge is today. I don't know what your your miracle that you're believing for. I don't know what... What stuff you're facing at work with a boss, a, a co-workers, relationships, family, children. Now, I don't know what you're going through. But listen, if you've been going through it, if you've been challenged, if you feel like, man, I can't take another step. You know, so many times we're, we're trying to find the end result. We're trying to get to the end result, which looks like five to ten years. And maybe it is five to ten years. But when you are so focused on only looking at ten years from now, it's going to be hard for you to take the one step you need to take today. Just the one step today. Like, okay, I, I, I feel overwhelmed with what, I, what, what I'm trying to reach in five to ten years. But I have to come back to reality that God is my helper He's my present help in time of need, and I just got to start with the one step. And then, you know, this one step is going to give me victory over tomorrow's next step. But today, I got to focus on this step. God wants to breathe in, and I love the song we sang today. Man, he is the breath of life. He is the breath of life. He wants to expand your capacity to endure whatever you're facing at this moment. And there's a a great verse that I love reading, and this is a verse that I've, 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 I've just stood on for so many years. It's found in Isaiah 40, verse 29 through 31. It says, he gives strength to those who are tired. I believe there are people in this church, just like the ADM, that are in here, as well as other churches that are tired. You're tired for many reasons. You're tired spiritually. You're tired physically. You're tired emotionally. Uh, you're tired relationally. But look what God says. But he gives power to those who are weak. Even young men become worn out and get tired. Come on, even the young people get tired. Our youth leaders were tired being at youth camp. 
Even the best of them trip and fall. In other words, you know what? You may have it all well put together. You are probably the best spiritual package that you think you are. But guess what? But even you will fall and get tired. And so no one escapes from this issue that we all have to go through in trying to, to catch the wind. Come on. The answer is in the wind of the Holy Spirit. There's the answer right there. And he says, but those who trust in the Lord will receive what? Why didn't he, say, why didn't he just say will receive strength? Here's why. Because the strength that got you from there to here is not the same strength that's going to get you from here to where you want to go. And so many times, as we have all experienced spiritual battles, physical battles, health battles, financial battles, we keep thinking, I'm going to get out of this situation the same way I got out of the last situation. But I'm here to tell you today that God wants to give you New strength, which means he wants to give you new methods, new strategy, new wisdom, new insight. Out with the old, in with the new. God wants to give you new wine. But if you have old wineskins, you're about to burst. Just tap your neighbor and be like, we need to get renewed. And the person next to you did not do that. Just cast the devil. No, just kidding. <laughs> but those who trust in the Lord will receive New strength. I love that. They will fly as high as eagles. How many are ready to fly? Man, I just want to come out of this thing, right? Come on, maybe you just been in the mix. Listen, turkeys flock, eagles fly. Stop being a turkey. Or stop hanging with turkeys. They're always arguing and complaining about everything. What's wrong with you? Eagles soar. Turkeys flock. Who are you rolling with? They will run. They will what? Run. Come on, second win. They will run and not get tired. How would you like to run this race in your journey and, and not get tired? I'll tell you how. we got to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not in our own understanding. When you start trying to figure it out in your head, when you're, when you're questioning every little thing that happened, let me tell you something. How is that working for you? How is that helping you? How are you getting better? How are you coming out of it? How is that benefiting you? And the answer is, it's not. But that's the challenge. The challenge is that when you've lost wind, you have lost win. In other words, right now, maybe you're constantly losing. Well, getting your second win is getting your second win in life. Some of us need to get a win back in life. You've been losing in your family. You've been losing in your marriage. You've been losing with your children. You've been losing at work. You just keep losing. Well, guess what? You don't have to lose forever. You can win again. Say it with me. I'm going to win again. Yeah. Man, when I saw my car all jacked up, I'm like, it, honestly, at the moment when the cops are there and they're arresting the dude, I'm thinking, and I already got hit on that same day. My pipes in my house busted that morning. Then I come home, they're calling me, cops want to see you. Cops want to see me, what the heck, what? And they're like, yeah, your car, whatever. I show up, they're, you know, I catch the guy hiding the drugs. I'm like, dude, cop, bro, shh, do your job, get him. He's hiding the drugs, what are you doing? And like, oh, okay. And they cuff him, they put him in the car. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Does that look like you're winning? No, it looks like you're losing. You're like, you got to be kidding, pipes today, money, car today. I'm thinking, money again. It's just, and, and you know what, at some point, it, it's not a matter of, of, of how you react. It's a matter of how are you going to respond in this moment. What are you going to do in this moment? When you're put up against a wall, when the pressures of life's, lives are pressing against you, you know what, that's what's going to show what you really say you value. David's a perfect example. David, you guys remember King David? David was constantly in battles. David was constantly in struggles. David was constantly running, chasing, hiding, fighting, chasing, just constant. It was like that was, I mean, 
We're talking about one of the craziest, most amazing warriors in history. There was no one after King David like him. No one has ever been like King David. That man has taken more kingdoms and got more victories than any fighter on planet earth. I'm telling you, King David was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. But let me tell you something, but, but challenged, but dealt with struggles internally, but dealt with thoughts that weren't probably the most purest thoughts all the time. Do you realize that David, though he was one bad dude, I mean, if you and I stood next to a David, a King David, we probably feel like little girls as men. Like, hi. I mean, <laughs> I'm not kidding you. So for you macho men, trust me, even you, you'd be like, like a little girl with him. Um, but King David, though, though, though he was challenged, the Bible says that in, in every battle, he always inquired of the Lord. Why, 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 why did David inquire of the Lord? Here's why. Because David knew as he had this custom, this, this DNA, this culture of constant battling. He accepted the fact that God called him to be a warrior. You can't say or even claim that you're a warrior, Mr. and Mrs. Christian, and not expect any battles. You can't even think like that. And so here you have David as a warrior. He, he learned, he learned to, to understand, just like you and I have to constantly learn to understand that, that not every battle have you been called to fight. I think right now some of us are tired because we're fighting the wrong battle that God never called you to fight. And so David had to develop a, a wisdom and understanding to ask himself by asking God, God, is this the battle that you want us to fight? Because I don't want to waste life and I don't want to waste time if I'm trying to fight someone's battle that never has, has been called to be in my lane. Or maybe you're fighting someone else's battle, right, that you were never called to run. And then you're wondering, why am I tired? Why am I weak? I think so many of us, we, we see the goodness in people and the potential in people. But just because someone has potential and you're just so upset about them not getting a victory, you can be the one that's being worn out while well doing. So you got to realize, is this my battle or not? Am I, am I called to fight this one? Or am I called to let this one go? This isn't mine. And so David inquired of the Lord. He said, Lord, is this my battle? Did you pick this battle? Because if you did, man, I'm ready. And, 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 and we know that, that in 1 Samuel 30, verse 8, look, it says, so David inquired of the Lord. And he said, shall I pursue this troop? Should, should, I, should I knock them out? Should I, should I, should I kill them? Everybody say kill. Come on, you got to learn how to kill on the way up. And I'm not talking about killing people. Don't get crazy in here. You know, if your neighbor's eyes twitching, you know, cast the devil out of that person. <laughs> yeah, kill. Yeah, kill. Ah! No. Yeah, you you got to learn how to kill on the way. In other words, you got to learn how to die to yourself. You got to kill yourself. You got to die to yourself. Kill, kill your way is the best way to say this. You got to learn how to kill your ways. What's your ways when stuff happens? What's your way of acting? What's your way of responding? What's your way of reacting? What's your way? Huh? Do, you, do you start blaming other people for your stuff? Do you start blaming your children? Do you start blaming your spouse? Do you start blaming your church? Do you start blaming your pastor because he told you the truth? Shall I pursue the troops? Shall I overtake them? And he answered to him, he said, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. And without fail. And without what? Fail. Come on. That means that there's going to be a time of testing in your life where you will either pass or you will fail. And the Lord told him right there, because you've inquired of me, you ain't even going to fail, son. You're going to go, and you're going to pass. You're going to collect the $200 on the Monopoly board, and you are going to win, and you're going to overtake everything the enemy has taken from you. And we know that David then goes running and pursuing the enemy, right? And he put a whip on the whoop, and they got the beat down of their life. The Philistines, they went down. They went down. But I want you to listen, please don't check out, because if you check out, you've already missed this message. So God gave him 
the green light. In other words, David developed an attitude that, that says, Lord, I am inquiring of you because I want to make sure that the attributes that I give to you is your response to give me permission to take the battle that you've given me. Do you guys get what I'm saying? That means that David's attributes his success by God's permission. In other words, when you start learning how to get God's permission, stop bringing out the God card. Oh, yeah, God told me. No, he didn't tell you. You're just, you're just emotional wreck right now, and that's what you're saying. Oh, no, the Lord spoke to me. No, he didn't. Stop. Did you fast? Well, no, he ate a burger today. Okay, well, yeah. No. No, did you, did you see God? Did you get counsel? So, so David, David was a man who was after God's own heart, but, man, he was a man that he attributed all of his success by God's permission of what he would, what he would do for God or not. And David pursued them, and we know that, but here's the issue. So they killed a lot of those Philistine soldiers, not all of them, but, but here's what happens. So he wins that battle, but guess what happens? Guess what happens? They came back. So you just when you got the battle, right, you got the victory, huh? Have you ever got the victory in an area in your life where you just finally felt like, ah, I finally have learned how to forgive because I, I, I used to be such a bitter person. But, man, I have learned to love. I have learned to let go. I used to be such an angry person. I got delivered from the spirit of anger. Man, I was so fearful at one point, but man, I remember the day where I just, I put a whip on that whoop, on that fear, and it was over. But you know what I've learned in 22 years of walking with God, and I'm still learning? I have learned that the things, the victories, the battles that you have defeated in the past, the things that you have, 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 have conquered will always want to come back. Have you noticed that your issues are never nothing new? It's always the old stuff that comes back to haunt you. It's like, oh, I developed this now. No, it's the same thing you developed and you conquered years ago, but you overcame it because you inquired of the Lord when you came to Christ. And then Christ started giving you the wisdom, the strength, and the revelation. And then you knew how to handle that situation, whatever that issue, lust, uh, pornography, anger, rage, uh, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment. You got a hold of that thing. But then all of a sudden, if you're not careful, let me tell you something, that thing comes back. But, but I thought God delivered me. He did deliver you, but you still got an enemy. And you still have choices that you make every single day of your life. And sometimes the choices that we make are the ones that open the doors to things that God had already shut. But we went ahead and unlocked it, and now it's coming full force. It's a quiet Catholic church this morning. <laughs> it's just very quiet. If we can all say at the count of three. The Lord said it. <laughs> yeah. Don't get mad at me. I, I, I was raised Catholic. Don't trip. <laughs> I love my Catholics. They're more committed than most Christians. Uh, let's go on. So <laughs> they go to church every Sunday. Uh, <laughs> the Lord said it. Hey, we got 45 great-grandchildren in my family. We have a huge family. Great-grandchildren. I have grandchildren. Great-grandchildren, 45. And the majority of my family, about 90% are all Catholic. I love messing with them all the time. <laughs> they, they make fun of me too. Everybody say, whatever I defeated comes back. I don't like that theology. Oh, well, read your Bible. I don't like that. No, I'm good, Pastor. Okay, good. Stay good. But at least you have the wisdom now on, on, on not waiting for something, but you have the, you've been armed with knowledge and revelation, and now you know, okay, you know what? I better, I better shut that door good because we can keep that door shut. Amen? But all of us have made choices in this life that have opened doors to uh, poverty that have opened doors to financial destruction. Yes or no? Right? Bad choices. Boom. What do you think happens? Okay. Well, 
we, we got we to gotta pay attention to that. So, so, yeah, I get it. So we beat it the first semester, and then like school, then you go on break, summer break. But then session's back in. And so the first time, it's like David, God said, God, God, in this, if you read the scripture, it says that God trained, God, God trained, he trained uh, David to war with his hands. You remember that? He, he trained him for battle. And so the first time, he trained him how to fight. Put your dukes up, fight, okay. And he knocked the, he knocked the wind out of the enemy, fine. But, but check this out. But the second time, it wasn't going to be the same thing anymore. Because now he's having to make a real tough decision just like you and I are. Because think about it. He's thinking, we already defeated these guys. Why are they back? God, I thought you told me that we would pursue them, take them, overcome them. And, and God says, yep, that's, did it happen? Yes, it did. Yes, yes, Father. That's exactly how it happened. Well, guess what? The enemy will always be around. And so, yes, I trained your hands for battle. But do you know what God does? God at this point then begins to train David differently as David once again inquired of the Lord. And you know what happens? So David goes to God and he says, God, they're back. What do we do? And mind you, when David, when David was talking to God, I want you all to know, I know that many of you are probably picturing he's in a room with a carpet and he's kneeling down and, you know, oh, the Lord. He's, doing, oh, he's not doing any of that. When, when David prayed, David prayed like a fool. What does that mean? David danced naked before the Lord in front of all the people. He didn't care. Some of us, we're too nervous and uh, afraid of what people will say if we pray for our meal in the restaurant. David didn't give a rip. And so he prayed before his men. Now, mind you, he had many men, about 600 men at this point of the story. And he's saying, God... In front of all his men, right here, you, all of you, all y'all pretend like you're my men, okay, and women. Here we go. You guys are soldiers. All right, God, so they're back. Um, what do you want us to do? And all the soldiers were looking at him like, what's the answer? Why? They've already developed an understanding. We know that when David inquires of the Lord, we're going to get an answer. And David would come, and he'd bring the altar, and he'd say, bring me the altar. And they'd all carry the altar. And, all right, now let's go ahead and let's worship God right here, right now at this moment. We're going to hear from heaven. And so they're all just waiting, everybody just waiting. Just picture 600 men just waiting, waiting on David's just, boom. You say it, David, we'll go kill. Say it, we'll take out. Say it, we'll overcome. Say it, we're ready. And David said, hold on. And God whispered. And he said, David, yes, you will overtake them, but not yet. I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting. When I ask my staff for something, and I'm like, so how long is that going to take? A week. Yes or no, Frank? I'm like, nope, I can get it done in three days. Yes or no, Frank? Yes or no. Is that true? Yes or no? When people tell me it's going to it's take about five days, no, it's not. It's going to take you a day and a half. I know because I've already done it. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and uh, it's, trust me. And so David's men are used to war. They're used to battling. So for them, yeah, David, David developed the hands to battle, and so that's what he was used to. But now God is saying, uh, but I'm going to give you a new kind of strength, David. We're going we're to change some things up. And, and he says, yes, you're going to overcome them, but not yet. And so right now, some of you, you have not yet overcome some stuff, but just be still and wait on the Lord because you're about to conquer. Amen? So don't get so upset about everything. Just be like, okay, this is a time where God's saying to wait. Now, waiting doesn't mean I'm doing nothing. So God tells David, he says, David, turn your back on the enemy. Now, get the picture in your head. All the Philistine army were right there, right across the valley, oh, taunting. And God says, turn your back on them. You know why God says turn your back? Because there's times in your life where you have to start learning how to defend yourself and just let God have your back. And he turned around. Imagine what his soldiers would think. Like, what is wrong with you, bro? David, why are you wimping out on us, man? Why are you? He, when God gives you a word from heaven, others will not understand it. But let me tell you something. 
when I know someone heard from heaven, that's because I've already seen the record. In other words, you shall know a man and woman by their <laughs> David had fruit. And so he turns his back, and the Lord said to him, wait. And so he turns his back. And I want you all to act like you're my soldiers, okay? I'm going to give you some lines. Just say, so he turns around. So you guys start saying, Pastor, what are we doing? That's a weak. You guys are a weak army. <laughs> Can't even get help. Online audience, please help them. Wrong voice. When you, when you learn to be still and know that he is Lord, the voices are going to get louder. And so what God was doing with David was giving him new strategy. Yes, I trained you for war by training your hands for war. But God is saying now, but now, David, I'm training your ear. I'm training you to hear my voice. Because you got too many voices around you that are constantly telling you, well, I think what you should do. Well, I think what you, well, I think, well, I think. Well, you know what I think you should do? Well, you know what I think? You know what I think? And, and it, God's like, no. So David came to the point, like, he's like, shh, shh. You're not the voice I'm looking for. And God said to David, David, here's when, so after he stilled everybody. I mean, that must have been an awkward moment, huh? 600 men just looking at him with his back turned to the enemy. That's awkward. Like, man, what is wrong with him? Is he, is he still, is he still, does God, is God still with him? I bet they started questioning his walk with God, questioning his strength, questioning his, his faithfulness, questioning his loyalty, questioning even his manhood. Are you afraid of them? And so he's, he's there, and then God says to him, David, this is when you'll fight. When you hear the wind, everybody say the wind. He says, when you hear the wind flow over the mulberry trees, when you hear that wind and the mulberry, the top, read it. I don't got time to read the Bible right there, that verse right there for you guys. Y'all read it. And he says, when the mulberry trees, the top of the trees start going, shh, that's when you get ready and you go for battle. So who knows how long they were all still before the Lord. But guess what? Once that, once that second wind came in, David turned around and he said, every man, grab your weapon. Every man, get prepared. Because today, the Lord has given us our enemy. And boom. What am I saying? I'm saying this. Is that if you're going to get a victory in the battle you're in now, you better get quiet, be still before the Lord. Because the strategy that worked then is not the strategy that's going to work now. God has new strength for you. God has new insight for you. God has new revelation. But would you be willing to be still and shut the voices outside of you so that you can hear the voice that's inside you and his name is Jesus? You guys still here? God was teaching them literally 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we shall walk by faith and not by sight. See, that's why he had him turn. I don't want you to look at that. I want you to believe me. In other words, he says, David, I want you to trust me for what I say and not what you see. For I will walk by faith and not by sight. But so many of us, we walk by what we see and not by what our faith says. That's the truth. So God was telling David, don't trust what you see. Trust what I'm telling you. Huh? 
I love that. <clears throat> let me give you this last part. Hey, hey let me just say this. P- people's actions or, or the words should not affect your destiny. So stop, stop blaming other people for your destiny. Your destiny is your responsibility. Stop letting others affect it, okay? Can we just, can we just say that right now? I'm not, I'm not this because of, no, you're not where you're at. Because you keep letting people's words affect you. You keep letting people's actions affect you. Why don't you go ahead and listen to the one who called you, who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light, and put your eyes on him, and then let him lead you to destiny. Amen? Yes. Please. (laughs) So I get it. I get it. I get it. Many of us, we just, uh, we want to waltz into uh, into the palace. I get it. We want to just waltz in like, I'm a Christian. I deserve it. Praise God. I go to church three times a month. Well, well, the truth, it's two times a month. But I go to church. I read my Bible every so often. I pray. Why should I go through stuff? Because here's the deal. You know what? Everybody wants the promise, but nobody wants the process. And the process will always super exceed the promise. God gives you a promise, yay. Then you start the process, and you're like, where are you, God? Joseph, 17 years old, God shows him a dream, a dream that he would rule over his nation, that he would be someone that would, that would help in times of famine. I mean, he was showing him some crazy visions, and he was 17 years old. He's a kid, and he starts telling his brother, guess what? I'm going to rule over you, and he tells his dad, you too, and, and the, man, the brothers are like, what the? Now, you ain't ruling over us. You're just, you're a little scrawny, little seven-year-old kid. What's wrong with you? Well, he kept just being passionate about God and just, he's a young kid. He didn't know any better, right? And he's just telling everybody what he saw. And so his brothers hated that. You know what they did to him? They sold him to slavery. So he starts by, they put him in the pit and he's in a hole and they were going to kill him. They said, no, nah, let's not kill him. Let's put him, let's sell him for money and make him a slave. So they bring him out of the pit. And they sell him to be a slave. He is now in, in Potiphar's uh, house. And now he's, he's a worker there. But then Potiphar's wife had the hots for him. And, and he was faithful to Potiphar. And the wife came at him and said, you mine. And he said, no, I'm not. And he ran from her like this. And she grabbed him and ripped his shirt. She then goes to Potiphar and tells Potiphar, he tried to rape me. And then Potiphar comes to him and says, now you're going to the dungeon. And he puts him in the prison. Mind you, it, started with all, it all started with a promise. <laughs> from the promise to the pit. <laughs> from the pit to slavery. From slavery to accusation. From accusation, he's in the prison. Now he's in the prison. And there were some men in there that were busted for stuff. And one was a cook and, and, and the other one was a chef. I forgot. A chef and then the other one was a... Uh, the, the wine tester, the cupbearer. And so the, 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 one of the guys, he looked at him, and, he, and the guy said, what, these are the dreams I'm having. What does it mean? He says, dude, you're going to die. He says, what? You're going to die. That's all that means. <laughs> Plain and simple. You're dying. You're guilty. And then the other guy said, well, you know what, blah, 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 blah. Here's my dream. And he said, you're going to live. And he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. He's like, he's, like, he's like, is there anything I can do for you? He's like, all I ask you. Joseph said, all I ask you is please, uh, when, when you go back into the house, can you give a good word for me? Can you put in a good word for me? Come on. Don't forget me, okay? What's the first thing the guy does? Man, he's making tamales and everything. For, he forgot all about him. Man, the brother was just cooking it all up. And guess what? And Joseph was in there. If I, if, and and, and I, don't correct me. Don't, don't quote me. But he was in there probably for about another 10 to 14 years, I believe, in prison. What? Where, what happened? What happened? From a promise to the prison. Innocent. But throughout the time that Joseph experienced every single event of pain in his life, not once did he complain to God and he just stayed fast. You know why? Because when he was pushed against the wall, it revealed what he really valued. And he valued the promise. 
And we know the story. He gets out. You know, he, the king needs it, uh, needed an interpretation, and he interprets, and they're like, yay, he's some. And then he, he goes now from, from, from the pit to the palace, and he's making this, and he saves his brothers and his family, and he, he brings abundance to a whole nation when there was famine because he was such a good steward of money, and it was awesome, right? That's his story. But how did he do that? He did that through faith, humility, integrity. Come on, he knew that that if 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 the God who delivered him in the past before he was 17 is the God that will deliver him now. And so we know that. We got that. True story, last night I was with um, with a, a, a friend, and he's a multi, multi-millionaire. I mean, I knew he was rich, but dang. I went to his house, I'm like, oh, my God, he's rich. And I've been in a lot of rich people's homes, I have, but not like this one. I walked in, and I was like, I'm not kidding you. I was, I, I'm, I hope nobody saw me. I was like this. And the hallways were endless. <laughs> Come here, Lord, this is awesome. I'm like getting lost in the house, you know. I'm like nobody. I mean, the, the place is huge. And I'm like literally walking through the hallways and another hallway and another. I'm like, what the? And there was nobody back there anymore. I was like the only one. And mind you, there was at least, at least three, 400 people there in his backyard. I'm like, what the? And then I look at the floor, all Italian marble everywhere the ceilings were like ginormous they were high and it was all italian made and just and i'm just like wow this is amazing it was his 50th birthday and so it was like a big party and everything i'm like wow and uh but two months ago he and i went out to lunch and we were just sitting talking and and he said Marisa, let me tell him my story and i said what is it man and i always knew he had money i, I knew that already but i didn't know his story and he said well here it is man He's like, 10 years ago, um, he's like, we were at the lowest point of our life. We had nothing. And, uh, and he said, um, I remember being with this client. I needed this account. I needed to get this, this, this business. And, and we were sitting at the only place I can afford, Chili's, Chili's restaurant. And, uh, and he's sitting at the table with him, and he begins to cast a vision and telling him all about the investment, whatever, you know, how business goes. And the waitress comes and says, sir, do, does, do either of you guys, anybody drive a blankety, blank, blank, whatever car? And, uh, and he said, uh, uh, but he's like talking. He says, like, he's like, because he's like, when you guys don't meet him one day. He's very passionate, man. He's very like expressive passionate. The guys, you walk in, he'll light up a room. He's just like that. Um, and so uh, he's talking to the guy. He's like, uh, well, if someone drives this vehicle, your car's being towed. And he said, what? And he runs out. And he sees the tow truck, and he jumps on the tow truck, and he's telling the guy, stop, stop, this is my car. And the guy, of course, he's got to stop. He's on the tow truck. So he gets off the tow truck. He says, please, man, this is my car. He's like, no, man, you're being repossessed. He's like, you're being repossessed. You didn't pay your bills. But so he's saying all this out loud in the parking lot, right? And he calls his wife in the parking lot. He's like, well, just wait, please. He calls his wife, and his wife tells him, she's awesome, Avelia, amazing woman. And she says, just get the baby chairs and the diapers. Do not let him take that. And so he grabs the baby chairs out of the car and the diapers and everything. And he's like this, and he turns around, and guess who was watching the whole time? The client. And he just, he cleans up. And, and, and I trust this guy. He's just the most integrous guy. I've been with him in his meetings and everything, integrous. And he looks at the guy, and he says, ah, should we go back inside and finish our conversation? <laughs> The guy looked at him and said, no. And he says, well, can I at least get a ride home? <laughs> so the guy gets a ride home and everything. Long story short. So, you know, he's a, he's a God-fearing man. God-fearing man. Very generous man. Very generous people. As a matter of fact, they're doing, you know, we're, we're getting more involved with at-risk children, rescuing them with sex, from sex trafficking, labor trafficking. So we're about to do a huge walk in October. And, uh, and they're, they're, my, my, they're the, my, my helpers hosting it and, and getting all their money friends to do this thing. Because we want to rescue kids globally. Amen? And so, uh, so anyways, so he's like so completely just submitted to God. Just honoring God with his life. Honoring God with his family. Just seeking God. Come on, inquiring of the Lord. And then you know what happens is, you know what, in his process, God had always showed them a promise. He always knew a promise. He said, I always knew that God had something big for me. I always knew I was called to be in the, in the marketplace ministry. In other words, being a business owner that is blessed. And he said, I knew that, but he's like, but it didn't look that way. 
Well, then God all of a sudden just opened some doors for him. And before you knew it, 10 years later, he's this multi, multi millionaire. And it's ridiculous. And you know what? Last night while I was at the, re- at the, at the house with him, um, he approached my table. He's like, hey, Pastor Rachel, what's going on? And, of course, I mean, everything was first class. I mean, live bands. They had two stations of foods that looked, my God, ginormous. And just it's like a, it was movie stars. You name it. Man, Maserati's driving up. Bentley's driving up. And then my rental Toyota driving up. <laughs> Take this car. And park it close. <laughs> Wash it while you're at it, will you? And walk in there like, I'm all that. That's why I'm dressing like this today. I'm like stepping up my game. I'm like. Okay. So I'm there and I, I open the napkin. Napkin, I mean, first class. It's just a jaw dropper. And I pull this out. And I remember this from our conversation. And this is made out of wood. Thin sliced wood. And he put a description on it on his 50th birthday. And the description reads, when the promise is clear, the price is easy. Is your promise real? Because if it is, then it should be easy to go through the process. But that's not easy what you're saying. Yeah, not easy with you, but easier with God. Because though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For the Lord is with me, and he'll guide me, and he'll lead me, and he'll direct me. And he will heal me and he will comfort me and he will renew me with new strength, new vision, new insight, new revelation, new. God is saying out with the old, in with the new. I want a new relationship with you. I want a new encounter with you. I want a new moment with you where the awe of God comes out of you. Amen. That's what God is saying. But we have to come back to that place and say, okay, God, forgive me for trying to do it the same way. I know that I conquered that thing then and it's facing me now. Well, guess what? You can face the giants in a new way. But that takes humility. It takes the end of arrogance, it takes a time of pursuing him. Stop pursuing your enemy and start pursuing God. Nobody moving around anymore. And I got volunteers. We're moving to our places. Nobody moving anymore. It's a holy moment. Stop pursuing your enemies. Stop pursuing bitterness, unforgiveness, doubt fears. Stop pursuing that and start pursuing the one that you will inquire of and he will tell you be still and know that I am God. And when the wind, the second wind blows over that mulberry tree and you begin to hear that new sound, he's going to say now go. It is well. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.